<laughs> Our next speaker is Alice uh, Schwarzer from, uh, well, now from the University of Washington. But uh, was this work done while you were still at UCLA? Uh, yeah, I was, um, I was a hybrid between Oxford and UCLA when I did that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, over to you, Alice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, so uh, I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Washington. Uh, today's talk is about work that I did with my PhD advisor, Mason Porter, who's a professor at the Maths Department at UCLA. Um, we call this project Motifs for Processes on Networks. And I'll start with uh, the um, one slide summary that will hopefully help you decide whether you want to um, uh, tune in or zone out for the next 25 minutes. Um, so perhaps a bit unconventional, but I'll have the slides of the I'll have the titles of the slides at the bottom so that um, my face doesn't kind of cover any uh, important information. This is my first time at this workshop, but judging from programs of the previous years, a common theme is an interest in information theoretic measures that can help in understanding neural coding. Uh, to me, this is an exciting exploration, a sort of um, venture into the virtual world of brain dynamics. And I say virtual because the measures that turn out to be helpful uh, to understand neural coding are measures of dependence between variables or sets of variables. They don't always have an obvious connection, at least obvious to me, to physical structures like axons and dendrites in the um, structural uh, connectivity of the brain. So my background is in mathematics and network science, and I am most interested in mathematical models of physical systems uh, and processes on networks. And today I want to talk about how to get the non-obvious connections between the virtual world of uh, information theoretic measures of neural coding uh, to the uh, physical world of structural connectivity and brains via mathematical models of uh, physical processes. And I'll be taking a motif-based approach <coughs> which means that I will focus on how small parts of a network structure influence microprocesses uh, that uh, can happen on, on a network, uh, and how in turn these microprocesses are associated with uh, small changes in information theoretic quantities. So of course, um, I only contribute to this work while standing on the shoulder of many other people, some of whom are in the audience today. Uh, Joe and Leo are among the people who have done some heavy lifting on connecting information theoretic measures uh, to dynamics on networks. Connecting dynamical systems to uh, structural connectivity is essentially a combinatorial problem, and I'll talk a bit about that today. So let me end the summary by explaining why I think this is really important um, to establish a uh, connection between um, uh, information theoretic measures and network structure. Uh, on a meta level, I think that establishing such a connection is a worthy goal in and of itself, and that connections between concepts that we already know are what pushes our understanding of the world and its complexity forward. Um, the connection here in specific uh, yields the physical interpretation of information theoretic measures. Uh, and with these interpretations at hand, we can start asking questions like what network structures are especially good or especially bad for maximizing or minimizing some quantity that we're interested in. And finally, measures of dependencies between variables are what we use to measure functional connectivity. And in fact, I will spend a considerable amount of time during my talk on what might be the simplest measure of dependence between two variables, covariance and correlation. Connecting network structure to these simple measures of pairwise dependence yields a theoretical underpinning for the relationship between structural and functional connectivity. Uh, and this theoretical underpinning is uh, certainly not the first and not the last step that people are going to take at the relationship between structural and functional connectivity, but, it was, but it's one that um, I find really helpful and maybe you will find it helpful too. Um, okay, so if you're still with me. Sorry, Alice, can is, I just, yeah. just interrupt? We're getting the craftiness on the audio again. Maybe we'll try switching your video off just in case it is a bandwidth thing. Okay. Is that okay? So I'll just uh, turn your video off fine. here. There we go. 
Okay. Can you hear me any better now? Uh, I'm not sure that it is, but, but maybe we'll try okay, a little longer and um, see how we go. So I can try one more thing. There's like a second Wi-Fi that I have access Actually, to. That, that uh, is better. That is better. Let's let's. Is it better? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Thank the slides you. are still up, aren't they? Yeah, slides are still up. All, all good there. What? Uh, slides are still up. That's all good. Okay, okay. Uh, then I'll continue here. So, Thank okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Joe. So, uh, so here's the, the outline for the remainder of my talk. Um, I will present a pipeline that starts with a mathematical model of a dynamical system and uh, a system property of interest. And um, using that as a start, uh, the pipeline leads to microprocesses, which I call process motifs, and motifs in network structure, which I call structure motifs. Um, I will demonstrate how this pipeline works using uh, the simple examples that I mentioned before, covariance and correlations of pairs of variables in the uh, Ornstein-Lumbeck process. So um, let's get started. As I said before, we start by choosing a uh, mathematical model of uh, a dynamic, dynamical system for neurodynamics. This could in principle be something like an integrated file model, but in practice it helps if that model is as simple as possible. So that's why we're looking at the onstein ullenbeck process. Um, we also choose a system property Y. Uh, in principle, Y can be anything. Uh, in practice, we need to obtain a matrix power series for Y, and that's not always easy. Because Mason and I have tried it, I can say that it definitely works when we choose Y to be uh, the correlation between two variables or the mutual information between sets of variables. Uh, and while I haven't tried it yet, I think it's worthwhile looking into uh, some of the, the other um, information theoretic quantities that have been mentioned earlier this morning by uh, Abed, for example, although um, uh, it might be that one would have to move to a time discrete setting in that case. So um, next, we interpret the terms of the matrix power series as contributions of microprocesses uh, to the property Y, which is the property that we chose in the beginning. Um, I will explain how we do that in a minute. And then uh, once we have the microprocesses, uh, we can start counting microprocesses that happen on small network structures. And uh, using the contributions of microprocesses, we can then infer the contribution of small network structures to um, the system property Y. And finally, using the contribution of structure motifs, we can learn how network structure can enhance or reduce information theoretic measures on uh, a network system. And to illustrate how this works, I'm going to talk about the simplest two uh, examples that I can think of, uh, which are covariance and correlation of the onstein ullenbeck process. So let's start on that. And first of all, let's talk about why you, me, or anybody should care about this very simple example. So um, the onstein ullenbeck process is a simple example of uh, a linear stochastic differential equation. It is uh, in continuous time. Um, it uh, is equivalent to the uh, first or to the first order linear autoregressive pro process in uh, discrete time, and uh, both the continuous time and the discrete time process appear frequently in studies of network in um, of uh, network inference in neuroscience and econometrics, for example. So. Um, there are good reasons to aim higher and study more realistic models for neurodynamics, for example, integrated fire models. However, in uh, theoretical studies of uh, these types of models, one can often, well, one has to at some point do some sort of linearization if you, if you want to have any type of uh, analytical results. And it turns out that if you do that, for example, uh, on the integrated fire model, uh, then you end up with stuff that uh, is either exactly equivalent or very close to uh, the onstein ullenbeck process. So let's talk about covariance and correlation. Uh, those are simple measures of interaction between uh, pairs of variables. Um, perhaps to the frustration to some people in this community, correlation is still a very popular measure of uh, functional connectivity, even if better ones have been around for some time. Um, 
The, stat the steady state of the ornstein ullenbeck process uh, is a multivariate Gaussian, which means that we can calculate uh, properties like mutual information and other information theoretic measures as functions of correlation or covariance. And that means that understanding how network structure enhances or reduces correlation on, um, and covariance is a first step towards understanding how it affects these other information th theoretic quantities. Uh, so here we have the ornstein ullenbeck process. Xt is a state vector um, describing a state at each node. Uh, think of a neuron. And uh, A is the adjacency or coupling matrix in which um, non-zero elements indicate that two nodes are connected by an edge. I is the identity matrix. Uh, this equation tells us that the change of the system of a small time interval dt, starting at time t, uh, depends on um, the network structure and the state of the system at time t. It is also influenced by uh, some additive Gaussian white noise, which is the term over here. So the onstein ullenbeck process is a mean reverting process, which means that if a variable diverts from its mean value, it tends to revert back to it over time. Uh, we see this behavior over here for a single variable x over time t. Um, the time series of x tends to be noisy, uh, but most of the time x is close to, to zero. If we perturb the system, which I've done over here and over here, so at two time points, um, we see that x reverts back to its mean over time. Uh, the onstein ullenbeck process also has a few parameters. So we have a parameter over here, var sigma indicates the uh, strength of the noise. Epsilon is the coupling parameter indicating the strength of the overall coupling in the system. And uh, theta is the parameter that sets the rate at which x reverts back to its mean. Um, and so, as mentioned before, for the uh, onstein ullenbeck process, uh, one can derive its covariance matrix at steady state uh, analytically, and one ends up with this expression over here. So what this equation tells us is that to get the covariance matrix, we need to sum over two indices uh, here, um, uppercase L and lowercase L. Uh, and uh, each of the terms in the summation is some product of matrices. We can get a similar expression for correlation uh, as well. Uh, there, the equation is overall longer, and uh, one has to do a little bit more work of uh, keeping track of all the summation indices, but the idea is basically still the same. So now we've completed step two in our pipeline. And before we continue, let me explain why the matrix power series is an important step here. So some graph theory fun fact is that powers of the uh, adjacency matrix tell us something about the number of ways that a signal can walk uh, from one point in the network to another. For example, when all edges have the same strength, the um, ij element of the fifth power of A indicates the number of ways that the signal can move from J to I in five steps. The fifth power of A transpose indicates the number of ways that a signal can move from i to j in five steps. Uh, and if we have products of powers of a and a transpose like over here, uh, that corresponds to having some unnamed source node from which signals travel to uh, i and to no uh, to node, uh, so to node i and to node j in like the um, numbers of steps specifi specified by the powers. Uh, and I for the rest of this talk, I uh, will denote these uh, kind of microprocesses using these walk diagrams over here, where you have these uh, blue arrows with numbers indicating uh, the number of steps that it takes to get from some uh, unnamed source node to i and to j. And this brings us to the third stage of our pipeline, uh, where we take a look at the matrix power series that we derived in stage two and find the process motifs that are associated with terms of the summation. Uh, for co the covariance power series, which we see over here, uh, we have seen on the previous slide that the associated microprocesses look so like, uh, like this over here. So here we have the process motifs for covariance, variance, and correlation. 
And what I like most about these uh, results is how intuitive they are. We see that um, process motifs for covariance between nodes I and J are microprocesses during which the signal moves from a source node to node I in lowercase l steps and uh, to node J in uppercase L minus lowercase l steps. Uh, when lowercase l is zero, then we just have a signal moving directly from I to J. And when um, lowercase l is equal to uh, uppercase L, then we just have a signal moving directly from node J to node I. So what this is telling us uh, is that statistical dependence between two variables can indicate a direct causal relationship between these two variables, or it can indicate that there is a third variable that has a causal relationship with both. And um, I think that's very intuitive. So similarly, we get uh, process motifs for variance from the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix. In that case, the nodes I and J are the same node, so the process motifs look like this. And finally, here are the process motifs for correlation. They look a bit more complicated, uh, but they are actually just made up of a process motif for covariance in the middle and uh, some number of process motifs for variance at node J and at node I. So what's really cool is that the matrix power series doesn't just tell us what the process motifs look like. It also tells us how much each process motif contributes. So remember that the, this part counts the number of occurrences of a process motif in a network. So we can think of an element of the covariance matrix as a weighted sum of counts of process motifs, which I call PI in this notation. And there's a weight associated BPI, that is the contribution of each process motif uh, PI. So where does the BPI come from? Uh, it just comes from the rest of, of the uh, expression over here. And that leads to some neat results too. So here we can see the contribution of a process motif to covariance um, and how it depends on the parameters uh, lowercase l and uppercase l. Uh, uppercase l uh, is the total number of steps that happen during this microprocess. So we have um, uh, we, we have the, the one signal of uh, transmission that takes uh, uppercase L minus lowercase L steps, and then we have the other one that's just lowercase L steps. Uh, intuitively, a process motif is with uh, few steps contributes more to, um, to covariance than a process motifs with many steps. And this is because uh, noise in the onstein ullenberg process decreases the signal to noise ratio uh, at each step. So if a process motif um, has many steps, it doesn't contribute as much to covariance uh, between two nodes. So another observation is that um, the contributions are large when the number of steps from the source node to node I and the number of steps from the source node to node J are roughly the same. And this is because the mean reversion of the onstein ullenbeck process ensures that a signal in a node decays over time. So for a large contribution to covariance, signals need to arrive at I and J at roughly the same time. Uh, so let's talk about the contributions of process motifs to correlation. We see that a process motif for correlation has a lot more parameters than a process motif for variance or covariance. So we can't really explore all parameter combinations here. But let's just consider a simple example. Here, I've set all parameters uh, basically to one. And the only thing that I worry is um, the number of uh, variance process motifs at node I and at node J. So these are NI and NJ in this diagram. Uh, and we can see that we have positive and negative contributions to correlation. This means that some microprocesses on networks can increase correlation uh, between nodes and other micro microprocesses can decrease correlation. So let's get to the part where we connect uh, process motifs to network structure. The main idea is to enumerate all process motifs that can happen on a small network structure. Um, and we can compute something that we call the total contribution of a structure motif. That is simply the sum of all weights BPI of process motifs that can occur on a structure motif. The problem with the total contribution is that we can't really write covariance or correlation as a weighted sum 
of um, uh, the uh, uh, to total contributions of structure motifs. Uh, because if we do that, we'd be basically overcounting uh, a lot of process motifs that can happen on uh, different structure motifs. So uh, we introduce specific contributions. Um, and these are just uh, the difference. So it's um, the total contribution of a structure motif minus all the contributions of subgraphs uh, of itself. And so using the specific contributions, we can actually then write uh, covariance and correlation and other properties just in the way as we did for the process motifs where we have the specific contribution as a weight here. And then here we have the count of um, structure motifs in the network structure. Um, so finally, we can use the uh, specific contributions to uh, learn about how motifs in network structure affect covariance and correlation of node pairs in the ornstein ullenbeck process. And here we see the structure motifs that have uh, between one and six edges and have the first to third largest contribution to covariance. And whenever a panel has this light orange color, uh, it means that the structure motif uh, has the top structure motif of the previous row as a subgraph. And we see a lot of these structure motifs include um, bidirectional edges, like over here and over here and over here, and uh, self edges at the nodes I or J, for example, here, 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 and here. This is because um, every self edge basically doubles the number of covariance process motifs that can occur on a structure motif. Uh, we can interpret these self edges and the bidirectional edges as short loops along which um, a signal uh, can uh, amplify itself uh, at node i and node j. So, and here are the structure motifs for uh, the largest contributions to uh, correlation. And they're a bit different. There are fewer self edges overall. In particular, there are no self edges at the nodes I and J. Uh, this indicates that the amplification of signals at the nodes I and J via short loops uh, tends to increase covariance, but not necessarily correlation. Instead, we find short loops at other nodes that send signals to I and J. And looking at the specific contributions of structure motifs with two edges, uh, we can find interesting stuff about um, simple synergistic effects of edges on uh, covariance and correlation. To me, the most interesting bit is that there are some structure motifs that have an overall negative contribution to correlation. So, for example, panel J tells us that if we have a network structure in which uh, a node J sends a signal to a node I, um, adding another edge from some other node to node i uh, actually decreases the uh, correlation between the nodes j and node i. And that's also intuitive because from j's point of view, uh, the signal in node, node i gets perturbed by signals from other sources. Panel A over here tells us that um, a single edge from j to i or a single edge from i to j has a positive effect on the correlation between the two nodes. But panel K tells us that actually the synergistic effect of uh, having edges going both directions is negative. So um, to conclude, let's go back to the slide that I put up in the beginning. We didn't quite get to the most uh, interesting information theoretic measures of neural coding, uh, but we worked on covariance and correlation, which are ingredients for quite a few information theoretic measures, including mutual information and uh, TSE complexity. We used the ornstein ullenbeck process as uh, a simple approximation of physical processes that might occur on a network of neurons, and we derived the uh, process motifs and structure motifs uh, and their contributions to covariance and correlation in the ornstein ullenbeck process. Uh, in the process of doing that, um, we found that a lot of the results either confirm or extend intuition on the relationship between covariance and correlation and network structure. So I hope to have convinced you that it is possible to obtain physical interpretations of information theoretic measures from a combination of tools from dynamical systems and graph theory. 
This approach gives uh, a clear quantitative link between network structure and um, uh, covariance and correlation, and possibly uh, more interesting information theoretical measures. And uh, we can obtain a mechanistic understanding of how network structure can enhance or reduce information theoretic measures. So in future work, we intend to use our pipeline to uh, get process motifs and structure motifs for differential entropy and mutual information for the onstein Wolenbeck process. Uh, this is very much work in progress. So here we have the uh, process motif for differential entropy. Um, there's, it's an absolute nightmare with the bookkeeping of uh, summation indices, but uh, we're working on that and uh, also getting the structure motifs for that. Um, there's, of course, uh, other information theoretic measures that one could feed into the pipeline and other dynamical systems. And this is one of the reasons that I'm very excited to participate in this workshop. So I'm here to learn about uh, the information theoretic measures that are relevant for neuroscience and where a physical interpretation of them might be helpful. Uh, I also expect that process motifs and structure motifs that uh, we've presented here uh, can be helpful for improving uh, methods for network inference. And so if uh, any of that sparked your interest, uh, you can have a look at our preprint or just get in touch with me via email or Neurostars or otherwise. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alice. That was uh, that was very interesting. Uh, well, for me, for obvious reasons, but I, I'm sure it was very interesting for everyone else as well. Uh, now, I'm going to turn your camera back on for the, the questions and answers. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, now we have a, a first question pop up here, so let's let's have a look at that. It's from Sarah, uh, so I'll, I'll invite her on screen if if she'd like. Um, so she says, "Thanks so much for the interesting talk." What do you think is the likelihood of getting similarly nice expansions for non onstein Wolenbeck processes? Uh, can you see that, by the way, uh, Alice? Sorry, what? Uh, can you see the question um, up on the up on the screen there? Has yeah, it yeah, I think I can. Yeah. Hi, should I ask it? Ah, oh, well, I, I just read it out, but uh, oh, sorry, you, you, can, was, add, you was... can add some. That's right. You can add some more information if you want. Um, so, um, nice examples of non onion processes. So, one thing that we can definitely go do is go to a um, time to speed setting to uh, look at um, auto regressive processes. Um, in principle, uh, I think one isn't stuck with uh, first order auto regressive processes. Uh, you could do that for higher orders uh, and just end up with needing to track more um, summation, summation indices. Um, in terms of other processes, uh, so, so one of the, the obvious problems is that all of this depends on linearization. So if your system isn't linear, we're going to have to linearize it first. And depending on what you want to achieve and what you're interested in, uh, that might um, be a deal breaker for you. But so that I think the, the, the largest um, uh, kind of restriction that we have is that essentially we operate uh, under the assumption that we have some sort of linear process or else the whole kind of motif de decomposition just doesn't make any sense. Sorry, Alice, by the way, I, I turned your video off again to try and help with the crackling. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be helping this time, though. Um, Sarah, did you want to clarify anything with that, or was that, was that okay? Good. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if no one else has a question, I'm, I'm going to take the liberty of, of asking one. Uh, Alice, can you come back to, I think it was the last, um, one of the last slides you had where you had you know, a lot of the motifs there for correlation mm -hmm. and covariance. Um, do you, am I still sharing my screen? Because uh, I don't... You're sharing your screen, but it's gone black. I think you must have gotten to the end of the slides and then oh, maybe see, gone okay. off, off the end or something. Uh, so um, let me reset the screen sharing then. Okay, if it doesn't work, I can I can explain it without that. Um, That's all right. I'll yeah, why don't you why don't you just just ask a question? I'll um... yeah. So one of the last ones that you pointed pointed to, uh, one of the last motifs you pointed to was in, um, I think it was in correlation where you had 
uh, a, um, a feedback loop between I and J and showed that that drew a, produced a negative contribution. Um, and you pointed that out as something interesting, but I was wondering if you had some intuition behind why that might be the case. Um, I had a feedback loop. Uh, well, so it, it wasn't drawn as a, like like a pink background. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was one yeah. where you had a, a a connection in both directions between I and J, which you, you could interpret. In oh, a, I see. A feedback loop. So, so the intuition there is that so net if you have if you have bidirectional coupling between our two nodes, so you have uh, uh, what you call a feedback loop then kind of overall you do have a positive contribution but that relies on the fact that you have positive contributions of the subgraph so meaning having a connection from i to j has a positive effect and having a connection from j to i has a positive effect um so these are kind of um so so to speak unique effects of the single edges and then the, the synergistic effect is kind of what you get on top of that when you uh, have the bidirectional edge so the feedback in there and so that tends to have a uh, a negative effect uh, synergistically because what you actually do is you create a, a feedback loop for node i and the feedback loop for node j and what you want is for correlation to have uh, kind of many paths of transmission between node i and node j but only few paths of um, uh, signal cycling back to node i and node j and essentially creating that feedback loop it does three thing, things at a time. It creates two paths uh, between the nodes, but it also creates uh, a feedback loop for each of the nodes. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And so the last bit is the synergistic effect that you see in the specific contribution. Excellent. All right, I'm going to uh, throw this one last question that's popped up to you while I call Fernando on stage to, to set up. So the question here mm -hmm. is, uh, what are the possible benefits of knowing uh, these motifs and their effect on their effects on uh, variance and covariance. How do we apply and use them? So I'll throw that over to you to answer while I'm, I'm calling mm -hmm. Fernando up on stage. Um, so um, maybe Hani could, could uh, clarify the question a bit. So it it, it really depends on on what, um, what, what he wants to apply this to. Yeah. Look, I, I won't call him on stage because we we do need to get the next next speaker right. up. Um, um, I think it's simply a question about motivation, uh, motivation for that, and, and how it could be used in, in practice. Uh, I think for me personally, the motivation was coming from uh, from more of a network science background was to uh, look at how we can understand uh, emergence in, in network systems, uh, and so for that, motifs are kind of um, a very popular thing to to do, where you look at. Uh, starting out with single edges, how do they uh, affect what happens in the network and then moving on to higher orders where you put several edges together and you look at how does that affect um, the behavior of the system, uh, how is that different from what you anticipate from just looking at uh, single edges in the system. I'm not sure if that helps, but like um, I'd be happy to talk more about that offline. Cool. Well, uh, let, let me say the question asked was, Hardy, uh, you can always post that to our Neurostars forum if you'd like Alice mm -hmm. to, uh, if, if you'd like to clarify it for Alice to, to handle in a bit more depth. Okay, so let's thank Alice again. And, uh, 